<laughs> Good night, everyone. Um, welcome tonight to another excellent event sponsored by the Women in Architecture Committee. Tonight, we are here to talk about the consequences, the hidden costs of the architecture profession, not actively seeking out, engaging, promoting, securing a diverse and inclusive workforce. We are here to understand how we can all be advocates for a more just and equitable future for our profession and to promote design and design processes that engage and influence and reflect our communities. Unconscious bias, we all have it. None of us are immune. We don't know what we don't know, and sometimes more importantly, we don't know what we've learned not to see. That said, it was with this awareness that um, the Women in Architecture um, Committee uh, determined that it was really important that they too become more inclusive and more aware. Hence, this wonderful panel that we've brought together with you, for you tonight. They will help us navigate and comprehend what is a truly complex issue, as complex as the society that we live in today. I believe that their stories and their work, their activities and their strategies will enlighten and encourage us to be able to understand the issues at stake and how we can and must actively and actively engage and be accountable for enacting change. With that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, first, Pascal Sablan, AIA, NOMA, Lead AP, with over 12 years of experience. She has been on the, a team for a variety of mixed-use commercial, cultural, and residential projects in the US, Saudi Arabia, India, Azerbaijan, and United Arab Emirates. Currently a senior associate at S9 Architecture in New York, Pascal is the 315th living African-American female registered architect in the United States. She's an architect, mentor, entrepreneur, and advocates to advance architecture for the betterment of society, bring visibility and voice to the issues concerning women and diverse designers. She is the founder and executive director of Beyond the Built Environment, positioned to uniquely address the inequitable disparities in architecture by providing a holistic platform aimed to support numerous stages of the architecture pipeline. She has been awarded the 2018 Pratt Alumni Achievement Award, the NOMA Prize for Excellence in Design and Building Design and Construction, and Design Construction 40 Under 40, She's been featured on the cover of September 2017 issue. Pascal is a 2018 AIA Young Architects Award recipient and was featured in the Council of Tall Building and Urban Habitat Research paper in the same company as Zaha Hadid. Ms. Sablan holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Pratt Institute and a Master of Science in Advanced Architectural Design from Columbia University. Pascal has, been given, has given lectures at colleges and universities all over the U.S., cultural institutions such as the United Nations and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American Heritage and Culture. Welcome, Pascal. Thank you. Giselle Santos Rivera is an associate AIA LSSYB Well AP Lead AP. She's a very busy woman, <laughs> is a medical planner and the global director of equity, diversity, and inclusion at HKS Incorporated. With national and international experience on a broad range of healthcare, residential, institutional, and commercial mixed-use projects, she thrives on building equitable practices, empowering the next generation of leaders, and creating inclusive platforms for engagement. She currently serves as the associate representative of the AIA National Board and as the AIA DC Chapter Board Secretary. She's a co-founder of the Latin American Interior Designers, Engineers, and Architects, LA IDEA DC Committee, the past chair of the AIA DC Equity Committee, and the founder of Women Inspiring Emerging Leaders in Design. She received the 2019 AIA Diversity Program Recognition Award. Giselle has been featured in several national podcasts and is a published author. She's a storyteller, a 2015 Christopher Kelly Leadership Development Program Scholar, and a recipient of the 2018 AIA Associate Award. Welcome to that. 
James Harrison is a principal and co-founder of Harrison Cornbread Architects, a registered architect with 30 years of experience. He holds a license to practice in Texas, Louisiana, Florida, North Carolina, Illinois, Arizona, Colorado, and the state of Washington. He received his Bachelor of Architecture from Hampton University and Master of Science in Architecture from Carnegie Mellon University. James began his career at the Chicago office of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. He worked for Stoffelbach Design, Dallas, Texas, Charles F. McAfee, FAIA architect, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Envirotech, Raleigh, North Carolina, and John S. Chase, FAIA architect here in Houston, Texas, before establishing Harrison Kornberg Architects. With offices in Houston and Dallas, Harrison Kornberg is entering its 17th year of practice. Their focus is on institutional projects, and their design portfolio consists of K-12, higher education, civic, and aviation projects. And last but not least, PJ Glasgow is the leader of the healthcare practice for the Houston area. PJ's work has included planning and development in the Texas Medical Center and collaboration with top healthcare institutions to create landmark facilities across the nation. A gifted facilitator, PJ can swiftly and elegantly bring diverse stakeholders to consensus. Passionate about diversity and inclusion in the profession, PJ consistently pursues opportunities to encourage diversity in all of its embodiments. She's the co-chair of Canon Design Univers Diversity and Inclusion Council, leveraging her experiences as an immigrant woman and a woman of color to continually push the industry forward. Let's welcome our panelists. So with that, I would like to get straight to our questions. Um, in an industry less than one in five, in an industry less than one in five recently registered architects identify as an ethnic or racial minority, where 3% of registered architects are Latinx and where black women make up 0.4% of registered architects, what are some of the consequences the architectural profession is facing for failing to become an equitable and inclusive profession? And I'll like Pascal to start. Oh, sure. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for being here tonight. We're really excited to collaborate with you on this discussion and to hear your position on things. Um, I think one of the largest shortcomings is we need to understand our irrelevance to the greater community. Oftentimes I'm asked, Pascal, how come young students or young kids of color are not more excited about architecture? And I said, we need to really reflect on our role and how we are presentive to those students or those kids. And when we're doing projects and construction in, in these different projects all over our communities, a lot of the times we're not engaging those local communities about what they need and what is there. And then those people have to deal with the debris, the construction, the rodents, and all the fun parts that happens with that, and the noise. And once that project's constructed, it's usually not for them. It's actually a signal and a sign that them and their family needs to be displaced and moved someplace else. So architecture, to many people, isn't the best gift to the world, but actually a very oppressive process. And by understanding that our role in architecture to them is not positive, the only way to change that is to actually engage them on that capacity, to talk about how architecture can actually solve some of the social issues and how we can make a built environment that's tailored to them and culturally significant for them, a historic building, a building that embodies what they are, who they are, what they've done in the past, and what they aspire to be. The other thing is, I think, as a profession, we tend to focus on wealthy patrons. We think about those as our clients, and that's the priority. And the client who's paying us to do these projects is not necessarily those who will be occupying the buildings. And leaving that voice or that experience out of our process is not... Um, and also greater, greater disservice. So ultimately, the consequence of not having a more diverse profession is actually continuing to create and construct architecture that is oppressive and unjust. Giselle? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, so in, in thinking about and trying to plus one what you just said, because <laughs> that, is, that is very much a part of the, the issue, is I, I think we lose we lose resiliency in the profession. Mm -hmm. We start to um, because we don't reflect our communities and we we don't let people feel empowered in, in being a change agent for their own communities. They leave, 
And a, a most recent statistic I, I read that, for example, the, the construction industry has increased, I think it's 53% uh, women in the yeah. construction industry, and a lot of them are women that leave the profession of architecture and choose what historically has been perceived as a more male-dominated industry because they feel like they have more agency mm-hmm. and they feel mm-hmm. like they, they are able to contribute. So I think not addressing these issues within our own industry um, perpetuates that, that inequity, the, the issue, obviously, that the, the mm-hmm. clients then become very, very singular. And I think it, it also reflects on a historically class basis. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if the right word. But um, our architecture promotes classism mm-hmm. as well. So if we, if we start to consider all of these pieces and we think about the consequences, is we will eventually become an obsolete profession sure. because we won't reflect mm-hmm. our, our environment. Right. And our environment right now is our biggest cause of concern. Right. So we, we really need to empower um, people to stay in the profession and, and get that to trickle back up to, to leadership so that there is a recognition that everybody has a seat at the table and they need to use their voice in order to be impactful and to provide better value for our clients. We need, we need people to stay in the profession. PJ, you had a few thoughts about this. I do. Well. And, um, you know, similar to what Giselle said, but I'll, I'll approach the consequences more from a business standpoint. Right. Um, and I think of it in terms of layers. You know, there's direct consequences, there's indirect consequences that happen from the business standpoint. And if you, you know, some, some recent examples, uh, specifically for myself, since I work mostly in the healthcare industry, uh, not the architecture side, but on the healthcare side, women are very well represented in the healthcare industry, much better than most of corporate America, mm-hmm. right? And so that clientele is looking for the diversity. And so walking out of some interviews and some communications and meetings with the clients, which happened in the last couple of years, it was very interesting for me to hear them say, when they meet certain groups of architects, uh, that they are offended. And that's the term that part them uses, they're offended, that the teams that were presented to them did not show their diversity. Mm-hmm. And, and that, to me, is a direct impact to the business that you are running, your core mission of building projects and bringing that business in. If your clients are not seeing the diversity and not wanting to give you those projects, you are losing income, right? I mean, that's a direct impact to your business. The second one in my mind, a little bit more indirect, is, is, is uh, building a little bit on what Giselle said, which is the revolving door. The amount of capital it takes, you know, it's whether it's the cost, it's the energy, it's the effort, all of it. When you bring people in, you hire them, you train them, you introduce them to clients, you get them to build the relationships. And if they find no affinity in your firm for others who are like them and then they leave, the cost of that revolving door is tremendous. Not only have you lost all the money that you spend in training your staff, but they walk out with the knowledge, they walk out with the relationships, and they make your firm less diverse. And is that really what we want within the firm? And so in my mind, those costs to firms, we, we can't afford it. If the clients are asking for it, if, if it's a direct impact to your bottom line, I mean, to me, those are some very big consequences firms need to be looking at. So, PJ, do you see any other industries out there that are effectively leading that equity and diversity and inclusion strategies? Um, and what can the profession of architecture learn from them? Uh, sure. Uh, I think the tech industry does tend to when you think about Google talking with some of these folks that you see in the news and you see some of the CEOs and the top level leadership that are coming out uh, being women. But, but the thing is, you know, none of these industries have it all figured out. Nobody does it best. Uh, the difference between them and us is they've talked about it longer. Right? They've had the conversations for a longer time. They've had time to reflect on it, which means they've, they've made their workplace flexible. They've put in benefits. They've done things that make, they've increased their pipeline, right? They've done things to retain the people, to create a bigger pipeline, to bring all of those folks in, which, which just means that they're that much ahead of us. So I wouldn't say that we are not, we're not learning or we're not there. It's just, we didn't start as soon as they did. I mean, I'll turn to y'all and see what you have to say. Sure, I will echo exactly what you said. <laughs> yeah. um, plus one again. Um, <laughs> When I've, I've been talking to several consultants now in my new role, trying to understand, um, you know, their, their wealth of knowledge. They, like you mentioned, they've been doing this for quite a while. 
um, more than I had even imagined. And a lot of them did start with technology. Mm -hmm. And they started in Silicon Valley because they, it was very evident. That was, uh, and because of the visibility of the industry, they needed to address these issues. So they started to, to engage with consultants. And the consultants, I think initially in the conversations that I've had with, for example, Paradigm, that has worked with several 500, uh, Fortune 500 companies, they start with recruiting and retention. And that lasted a few years. And then they realized you can do so much up to a point when you talk about hiring and recruiting. If you don't have the culture to back that up, um, then you're, you're kind of void. You do all this work to do, to pretty much stand in the same place. So the technology industry, um, has been leading this in a way because it's been a longer conversation. But I also learned a lot that professional organizations like engineering and law and medicine have also been doing significantly better than we have been doing. There's a, a wonderful consultant called, um, her name is Joan Williams. And she used to work for SOM at one point, and she says, um, I can tell you, because she, she founded the Center for Work-Life Balance, I can tell you that I've been 20 years following the trajectory of the architecture profession, and you are the farthest behind. And I don't know exactly how to tackle that, uh, because we've been trying to engage, we've been trying to broaden the scope, and we just, it doesn't resonate. And we, we can say here, and, and it's evident, there is a business case for this. But we are very late to the game. And um, I think more than being late to the game, I know that's, yes, that's, we're past that. Uh, I think we're doing, we're doing better in creating that level of awareness and acknowledgement of creating these panels. Uh, but we, we need to recognize that we are quite behind in comparable industries that would have, like I mentioned in the construction industry, in her, from her perspective, they're doing better than we are. And for us, in our mentality, oh, we, we've always been better look at construction. They're doing worse. No, their acknowledgement, and it may have to do a little bit with litigation and visibility, but in her, in her perception, we're doing, we're doing really poorly. Uh, like, for example, right now, there's still no survey on race and architecture in the workplace. Um, we're, we're, yeah, slow. But I will say, um, there are firms like Perkins and Will, who have set up matrices about how we're kind of codifying justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the workplace. And what I love about what they talked about is that they're doing it annually. And it's across the board from all of their different offices, which means it allows for the different offices to identify where, what are their unique challenges. Um, and I love the fact that it's also annual, which means it's a constant conversation. It's not, okay, we're going to adjust diversity today. Oh, we're done. And on to the next issue. That we're realizing that we're, there's growth, opportunities for growth, a metrics to keep track of how we're doing. And I thought that that was pretty brilliant. And I wanted to kind of bring that out as an opportunity of how architecture has begun to create some of that responsibility in maintaining that. The other architecture firm that I visited um, in New Orleans when I did the Design Justice Summit it's called Concordia. Mm -hmm. And what I lo love about this firm, and I should like get a check because I talk about them all the time, <laughs> um, is that they actually start to address the other issue that I tend to uh, harp about, which is community engagement. Right. And so for all their projects, they have a community fellow that's on their team, which is a paid position for somebody of the community that's impacted by their project to participate in their weekly design meetings. Because instead of saying, hey, community, come after work when you're tired with your kid and eat some cold pizza and hear about our project and tell us if you like it or not, right? <laughs> this time it's like, no, community, we want your continued voice. We want to hear you, tell you, tell us what we're doing wrong, and then we can tell you what our process is, and you can also engage the community and go back and forth. So this is a consistent relationship, um, which I thought was also a really beautiful business model. Um, as another way. And they've said, if a client said, hey, looking at your proposal, that line item right there, can we cross it out? And they said, listen, if you don't find value in having the community's voice in this design process, then we're not the architecture firm for you. Um, and I think just understanding that as architects, we have that power um, to create the teams and how we educate and kind of educate our clients, but also engage the community in the process. So yes, we're far behind, yeah. not going to distribute uh, distribute that, but I think we have been taking really great steps and there's some role models out there that we can use in our, our process. So, I mean, so Pascal, like, sounds like Concordia has been able to um, rise above some of those barriers that typically inhibit um, architecture firms from um, being inclusive. 
Um, can you identify what are some of those bar barriers that are limiting our recognition and the advancement of diverse talent in our um, profession? Sure. So um, my favorite story to tell, so forgive me for those who've heard it before, is when I was studying architecture at Pratt, first week of school, um, I think one of those architecture history classes, um, he said, all right, everybody, you and you stand up. So me and this other classmate stood up and said, okay, you two will never become architects because you're black and because you're a woman. So I'm standing there going, holy, like how did he, um, you like how I edited that? Mm -hmm. um, how did he uh, can be so audacious to make this claim knowing he didn't know my name? I also realized that I was in a room full of like 100 plus students and everybody was like, okay, right? Like nobody kind of went up in arms. And when I sat down, the student to my left said, you know, you better not let that be the reason that it stops you, right? And I think about that moment all the time. And I remember in class when I felt sick, I'm like, nope, I have to go to class. I can't be the black girl that doesn't go to class, right? I can't <laughs> represent us in that rap fashion. I realized that I was never just going to be Pascal Sablon. I was always representing my gender and race to some capacity, whether I choose to or not. And when I reflected why he was so audacious to make that claim, I realize it's because how we taught about architects. Are we ever really educated about black architects or African-American architects, minority architects, women architects? And so understanding that, I took a step back about our education process. And Albert Schenker, which was the president <laughs> of the Federation of Teachers from 1964 to 94, so he really controlled the public school system in his capacity. And he talked about um, never letting the African-American child connect with his or her history because if you do, they'll connect more with their ethnicity and will not become an American. Also, never keep record. Don't keep history either. So with those two things, we're actually, our education process actually has started to have this force of erasure that never kind of holds the truth of what we've done. And if you don't have examples of representation, then the assumption is we don't have the capacity for things as simple as our gender and race. And so representation is huge for me, and it's part of the, a lot of the reasons why I started my organization, Beyond the Built Environment, and why we have our initiative called Say It Loud, where we elevate those. It's because it's about elevating those in those communities so that we know we exist. Not that we need to be introduced to the profession. Oh, no, we've been here doing amazing work. It just needs to be elevated and celebrated. And so understanding, okay, that was education, that was school, then what is the greater community's perception of us? And so we have all these programs with NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects, such as Project Pipeline, where we engage students about architecture. They get so excited. And if they go home and Google the word great architects, Google banner pulls up 50 faces and names, from contemporary architects to uh, Leonardo and Michelangelo, right? And in this 50, none are African American. And one is a woman, Zaha Hadid. And nine are minorities. Zaha's clutch, she falls into both categories. You know, what would you do without her? Um, and so, so I went to Google headquarters in New York and said, hey, when I run this search like this, this is what I see. And it's saying that there's no significant architect, woman or of color, between now and when architects were work Ninja Turtles. So what's happening? And I said, Pascal, there's not enough content out there that actually identify you all as great. We're so quick to write the great Frank Lloyd Wright, but we don't write the, Fra the great Paul Revere Williams. Why is that? So I always encourage those when I speak is like, listen, when somebody's writing an article about you, make sure they write that you are a great architect because we need to create the content. We need to create that content so that people know and so that it comes up. And that's also why I launched the Great Diverse Designers Library and write the word great in front of everybody's name so that when you want our search, you will get a more representation of us in the profession. So I guess I say all of this to say, that there's so many tiers of representation and elevation that goes from what the messaging is at school when we're studying, what it is at work, who are our leaders in the workplace, um, the students, what they're being told, and the greater community and our relevance to it. So just understanding that it's important to let make sure we're seen is a big mission of mine, and I hope that you all will make sure you're written as great as you move forward in your career. <laughs> I did. And, you know, you shared a story about somebody making you stand up. And uh, 
I wasn't sure if I wanted to share, but I will, <laughs> now that you did. Uh, and really, I, I grew up in India. Um, and so, and I did my bachelor's there, and I, I wanted to come here. Lots of different reasons of why I wanted to come here. And the architect that I was working with at the time, it just, just really upset him that I was leaving. And Giselle and I were having this conversation before, is ill intentions, unconscious bias, it, it's to the eyes that just don't want to see, you will never see it. And so his, his uh, recommendation to me of why should you not go to the U.S. was, well, uh, you're a woman, you're petite, you're soft-spoken, you just will not succeed in the U.S., you shouldn't go. You know, um, and his, his intention, as I was telling Giselle, is, is not to say those bad things, but it was, you're doing so well in India, you know, you're having such a great time, and I love having you here in my firm, why would you want to leave? But the words that come out... And what you hear and what they actually say is you will just never combine those two to, to ever be anything other than ill intention, right? And so the, the profession of architecture, and I think we, we do this to ourselves in terms of barriers, uh, and I'll speak specifically for women. So I'm a mom of twins. My twins are eight-year-old, they're, they're girls. And um, we are our own worst enemy. You know, you want to be you want to be the best mom. You want to be the best friend, the best architect. You you want to be the best friend to somebody. And you you want to do a, be the best daughter, the best whatever. You you just have those aspirations for yourself, never recognizing that at some point in your life you can't be everything to everyone, not even to yourself. <laughs> no human being is perfect. Specifically, you know, so trying to make a woman perfect, uh, why would you do that? There's there's no human being that is perfect in any way. And so I think encouraging women to see the choices, the priorities, and having those environments that are flexible in the workplace to me is really important. I mean, even when you Google, you know, what did architecture look like in the past, you come up with these pictures of men in white shirts and black ties sitting at a drafting board, like scores of them in rows and columns, and that's the vision of architecture. Uh, coming from there with the long hours that you have to spend, the crazy sprints to deliver projects at the end of it, the unequitable pay, I mean, all of those in my mind is why you, you are eliminating a segment of population that cannot keep up with that. If you don't have that flexibility, if you don't have the pay that takes care of your child, if you don't have work from home policies, you are essentially eliminating a segment of population from your workforce. And whether you're thinking of that in diversity of thinking, diversity in terms of gender, in terms of race, religion, age, it's all of those things, you know, and we do tend to talk about gender a lot more, but it's really all of those things. And that inclusion, in my mind, those are some of the big barriers that we place before ourselves. So then, you know, we have these barriers, whether we're placing them in front of ourselves or whether it's the architecture, the history, the tradition of architecture. Um, what do you guys see as some of the strategies that will help us surmount those barriers and help build a network of more diverse candidates? You know, um, maybe Giselle, you want to sure. speak that one? Sure, and I'm going to echo a lot of what, what Pascal said. I probably do that all the time anyway. Um, I think establishing clear benchmarks and metrics, uh, especially in your promotions process, mm -hmm. uh, your demographics and your gender, and especially in, in architecture, your demographic, your, you have to look at the pool of people that are especially designers. A lot of people come into architecture because they want to design. And a lot of the people that leave architecture is because they can't design. Or they are not able to be in a, in a position where they, they have agency to do that. Um, so I think as, as a baseline, you have to create a common language to understand what equity, diversity, and inclusion, and justice mean. Typically, most people don't know how to define it particularly. So you have to create a common language. And you have to hear what people say when you talk about equity, when you talk about diversity, when you talk about justice, and you talk about inclusion. Equity is not the Me Too movement. Diversity is not African American. And inclusion, they usually have no idea what and that means. <laughs> um, so cle creating a, a clear understanding that there has to be a common language and that there have, you have to look consistently at, me, at metrics. And I, I particularly would, uh, would encourage people to look at the promotions process, how people get promoted, and don't look at the pool of people. Look at the gender pool that you're, being, that you're selecting from. Look at the percentages. I know, I think it was the girl that interrupted 
and, and lean in and said, if we continue in the practices that we have currently, even though we're more woke now, uh, if we continue in those practices, it'll take, I think it's 200 years to reach equal parity. So 50-50. And usually the conversation is, well, we don't have 50% women in the profession. Uh, why would a board look like that? And I said, well, the reality is it doesn't look like that because you don't have a 50% board. So you can't look at it as what happened in the past and why we are where we are. Change significantly where you are right now, and then everything else will follow. I, I always say a Jedi is a candle that you have to burn for both ends. It has to be the grassroots. It's the people that have the energy and the passion for this. But it's the structure that also supports those systems, and you have to burn from those both, both ends. So it's a recognition. For me, it's, it's really putting a mirror and at the firm and the people and, and sharing that back. Can I add a comment about the promotion sure, sure. process? Uh, a, a, a live example of that is, you know, I love, love that you added the promotion process needs to be scrutinized, is travel policies, right? Or, or working long hours. Well, um, you know, your bonuses and your raises and the great projects you get are based on all of those things. Yeah. And again, going back to the comment of you just don't hear yourself, and again, no ill intention, but I don't know how you not take it personally. Yeah. When you reach out to someone and say, well, Matt decided because, not even a woman, Matt decided that because he had kids, he wants to stay at home, be with his kids, uh, he doesn't want to travel. And you know, we just had the conversation with him that since you've made that choice, you understand that your rise in the company will be a little slower, you may not get to the leadership level, and that was actually a conversation that took place, and that was acceptable. And, and you know, so really that promotion process of your bonus is based on the extra hours that you work. Uh, so you're encouraging inefficiency, I guess, in some ways. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't understand any of those things. It's, it's like, how, how can you base, you, there are people doing exceptional work, being incredibly efficient in eight hours of time, never having traveled, but that is not what gets promoted, right? There's people who are sitting and socializing to two o'clock in the morning, that's what counts. And that to me is just such a huge challenge in our industry that we just, we just have to overcome. All right, so James, you own a firm. What do you do to make sure that <laughs> You know, how do you keep and retain that diverse talent? You know, honestly... Um, he got the hard question, right? <laughs> I thought I just paid more and got this great seat. Because, I mean, I'm just in awe sitting, you know, by these amazing women just listening to their stories. So I thought that that was... You know, I just kind of worked the deal to be up close and personal. Um, you know, it's interesting, but we've had these conversations and to, to listen to the dialogue... When we started our firm, we started our firm because we were really trying to be everything that every, we were trying to be everything that every other firm was not. And everyone always complained about, you know, there's this hierarchy and there are these politics and, you know, not to bash SOM, but I remember working there and I remember just all the, the politics of, you know, jockeying for a position. And so we started our practice with this really flat sort of organization. Like, it's just flat. Everybody's, you know, everybody's doing great. Everybody's on the same level. And what we noticed was the staff came to us and they were like, well, okay, how do I, how do I know if I'm doing well? And we were kind of like, you know, ignorant to us. We were kind of like, well, if we don't say anything to you, then you're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Think, yeah, you're doing great. And so um, as we started uh, getting larger and larger and there were more people coming in and we were starting to sort of package projects and, and, and project types into teams, then this sort of hierarchy kind of evolved. And then when the question was presented to us, you know, how do I know if I'm being elevated or how do I know if I'm moving to the next level, then it was, okay, we got to fix this or we need to put something in place. So over the last year, we totally like restructured everything. We went through and we said, okay, well, let's look at the AIA and let's see how they're 
ranking people or how they're grading people as far as expertise, as far as education, and let's evaluate our staff and see, you know, if we if they fall in this line. And then instead of us going to everyone saying, you're a one, you're a two, and you're a three, we said, okay, we're going to have a meeting. And we're going to say, all right, here's what we think based off of what you've done and you know, your education and the projects you've worked on and the number of projects you've worked on. Well, what do you think? And some people came back and said, well, no, I'm not a two, I'm a three. And some people came back and said, well, well, no, no one came back and said, I'm not a three, I'm a one. But yeah, it was really a, uh, a dialogue with the staff to understand, um, you know, where do you want your career to go? And what does advancement and what does promotion look like to you? And, and the interesting thing about it was as we started um, making associates and advancing people in our firm, it wasn't just about what you do on a project. It was also about what you do to contribute to and advance the culture of our firm. And so that culture could be participating in things outside of the office, taking leadership, showing that leadership. Sometimes there's not the opportunity to lead on a project just because of the way the project has gotten started, but you can still exhibit leadership. And so that leadership was recognized and those people were elevated to associates. So um, that's just one thing we've done. Um, but it's interesting, you know, I was, I was, again, I was sort of listening to everyone and I was just kind of in awe with, uh, with everything they were saying. We were, you brought up the issue of, uh, of women and kids and that dynamic has really changed, uh, over the years for us. We, again, when we started, we were, it was just four of us and then, you know, we grew and grew and grew. But I remember when we first started, um, there were, of that four, one of our employees was a woman, um, and she had just had a baby after the two of us, Daniel and, and I, uh, and our families had had kids. And so we've always done this thing in our office where, you know, when you're getting married or if you're having a kid or something, we'll sort of celebrate that in the office. And um, she was having a baby, and so we bought her a gift, and Daniel and I usually try to get the biggest gift we can for the staff. And we bought her a pack and play. And so um, she brought that pack and play to work and she put it at the end of her desk and she had her kid down there just sort of, you know, doing what the kid does while she was doing her work. And uh, uh, this architect, I don't know if she's in the audience because I can't see, but this architect is, you know, she's just like, you know, I can do all. She's great and I love her. She, uh, uh, but she was... You know, she's like, I don't want to sit at home. I want to go back to work. And so we were like, well, yeah, just bring your kid in and they can hang out there. And so <laughs> now when, uh, when you look at our office, particularly around spring break and around the holidays and when kids are sick, they're just kids. People bring their kids to the office and there's a big box of Legos and their <laughs> strawberry shortcake DVDs and you just, it's, you know, we just look at it as it's, it's real life. And maybe we're small enough to do that, but we hope that culture doesn't leave as we hopefully get bigger. What's interesting is that um, I brought my pack and play to uh, finish a deadline because I wasn't allowed to do overtime as a new mom. We'll get into that later. Um, and actually the opposite reaction, like I got into so much trouble for bringing my kid to work after hours to ensure that I made my deadline um, because I wasn't being a proper parent. Again, we'll talk about this later. Um, but it's just interesting to hear your story because um, in my head, I want to be the architect that can do all things also. And I needed to be with my kid. And I also needed to make sure that my client was happy for our big presentation the next day. So I thought, OK, bring bring him here and we can um, get the work done. And I got my work done. My client was very happy. But I was definitely reprimanded for, for that effort. Um, but back to your question, if uh, firms wanted to have a strategy of how to build a, a network of diverse candidates, I want to say that HBCUs um, put out about 50% of African-American graduate students every year, right? So out of the 50% of the kids that are coming out are coming out of seven schools. So if companies are really trying to create a pool, I think really engaging with HBCUs in a 
uh, many ways, financial as well as participate in their career fairs, create a pipeline to their office for internships or positions, I think is critical. Uh, NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects, is another great resource that firms can need to tap into, and there's different tiers of engagement that they should think about. And then you can look at the Beyond the Built Environment diverse, Great Diverse Designers Library to see who are some of the local talents who are doing great things in your communities. Um, and I think all of those things are just kind of saying um, there's resources out there and there's organizations that are championing these things. And AIA also is another resource. But really engaging these um, different organizations can help, help you as well. So maybe it's not about creating the policies by yourself, but looking at to what are the metrics that are being out there and then formulating and ca carving it to what you would need. So I think those are really great ways of uh, creating that pool. So you had talked a little bit about um, creating a culture of belonging, just and a sense of belonging. Do you want to um, kind of wrap up this question with your thoughts about that? Sure. I think I think James really tackled that a little bit. I think for me, when you really think about EDI and you think about Jedi, the the confluence of all of these things is truly creating a culture of belonging, where people feel like they are empowered, they have agency, and they have an opportunity to succeed. Um, so I, I, I love that pretty much the story sums up that, that idea that in order for people to feel empowered, they need to find their own measure of success. So if success to you means bringing your kid to the whatever that's called, because I don't have kids. So <laughs> I could bring my puppy to work. I would love that. Um, but if whatever, however you measure your success, that should be what the culture reflects. So it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It shouldn't be somebody measuring how you can be a good parent. As long as you feel like you are able to succeed and you measure it in your own way, if your culture and your firm reflects that, then that's how you really create that sense of belonging because everybody feels like they, they can own their path and their future. Um, so that was, yeah, that, that was But also great. thinking about consultants, right? We also talk about like diversity in terms of our staff, but then... When it's time to do consulting for projects, we're only like, all right, we need some firms because this is a requirement on this proposal. It needs to, we need to also reflect the relationships of diverse consultants also as an important and equitable partner in these projects, irregardless of if it's, and I know it's a fake word, but irregardless of if it's required or not by the procedures of getting that project. So I just wanted to throw that in there. So, um, so Giselle, I have this one for you. How would you advise leaders to seek and respond to feedback from their employees? Obviously, now you've kept them, and James talked a little bit about how he engaged his employees and got them all to express themselves and explain what they wanted out of their career. How, do you, how would you advise um, leaders to um, engage their employees and, and, and gauge the effectiveness of these initiatives that they put out there for equity, diversity, and inclusivity? Uh, so I think uh, now, now after hearing all of these conversations, I think it's a lot of all of these things layered together. So when I think about immediately, I could say, well, you have to create a culture of self-awareness and for people to, to feel like it is important for them to, it's okay to feel challenged. It's okay to mess up. Everybody's going to mess up in this work. Like I do something really, oh my God, I do this all the time. We say guys to everybody, yeah. right? I'm like, hey guys, how is it? I'm in a call and it's women in architecture and I say, hey guys, how's everybody doing? <laughs> uh, so we know we're going to mess up, but we have to own it and be comfortable with being challenged. So aside from those things that I feel require likely a consultant to come in to share, to, to sort of reflect that mirror and, and really talk about unconscious bias, interrupting bias, what are microaggressions. So that, that level of, of, of education always needs to happen. Uh, but for me, something that I've learned in this year uh, doing this, this work as, as EDI director. I think it's really important, and I mentioned that before, to create a, a common language, to define the common language, but to create a structure that supports that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I sort of mentioned that it's, at HKS we call it dead eye champions, people in the offices that measure how they feel the culture exists and what it is in their offices and reflect that in some measure. So we have culture surveys, that's sort of more ubiquitous these days. But you create these structures. So we have the Jedi champions, we have the Jedi council, and now I guess we're going to do an award with a lightsaber. But <laughs> the Jedi council is at a very high level in leadership, and we also have Jedi advisors that are people 
for example, we're a large firm, so we have the opportunity to partner with messaging, with talent, uh, talent acquisition, HR, and they help us uh, empower those specific initiatives that come either grassroots from the champions or are being defined by the, the equity council. So when I think when these structures start to, start to align and everybody has a common language, then if you have that feedback loop, like um, Pascal mentioned that Perkins and Will has developed, we have something very similar, and in the future we would like to make it more robust, where you create surveys that start to measure the goals that you have determined through this structure. And throughout the years, then you define what that ideal culture wants to be, and then you measure against that. And ideally, once everybody has that feedback loop and, and has that structure, then people feel more comfortable having those uncomfortable conversations. So when people feel like they have that structure being supported, they can go to their leader and say, this is really how I feel, and they will feel comfortable being vulnerable and open. But it is a lot about education, and it's so much about self-awareness, because you can put all of this in place. But if people don't feel like they have a stake in it, even, and I always say, the old white guys, because they self-define as old white guys. It's not me saying that. Um, but they also bring something to the table. It's geographic. It's your background. Not everybody is monolithic. So if, if they own that they are part of the solution, um, I think that's, that's sort of my thoughts around a feedback loop. Um, but it's a, it's a big structural conversation for me. But I think there should also be about multiple types of feedback loops. I think we can have large panel discussions to talk about how a firm is kind of with their employees. Um, you can have one-on-one -on -one meetings and sessions for those who are not bold enough to talk in public. I would start creating committees and groups so people can have ownership in the process of creating diversity and equity and justice um, in the, the built environment. So I think there's many ways, but I think there's an understanding that not one solution will solve it all. That the, the language and communication styles of everyone's going to be unique. And so providing multiple paths and avenues in which people can give you feedback on not just a once in a while, but actually consistently and have multiple moments for that would be really powerful and also gain that trust to see if somebody voices their concern and then see it actually be implemented in a policy. And then, oh, okay, well, you know, Giselle said something, and then while they actually did something about it, all right, well, then, hey, I got an idea. Here's something that I'm bothered with. But, you know, we also have to build that trust um, with those who are asking to be vulnerable and to share their fears and to share their concerns and actually do something about it. About it. And there's one other thing you, you said right at the beginning, Pascal, which was uh, it, it's, it, it's continuous, and really a lot of leaders tend to treat it like a project. You know, it's something that has a start and a finish, mm -hmm. and I did five things, and yay, yeah. let's keep doing those five things forever. And in my mind, it's not. It's a journey, and I think that's the best advice mm -hmm. also that you, you, you talked about, which is it's really an opportunity to be doing this forever and mm -hmm. making yourself better all the time. This is not a dead end, and there's not a finish line, right. and there's not the deadline that you're trying to reach. It's, it's, it's a continuous improvement process. Absolutely. I think... Um, I think that the, there's accountability on both sides, or maybe it's probably not accountability, but maybe the, the appropriate word is, is courage and vulnerability. Uh, oftentimes, uh, speaking specifically for a, a small firm, um, I can't speak for a large firm, but for a small firm, you start these things and then you, you run down this road and then all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, I gotta bring work in the door. So you sort of get diverted and you're thinking about other things, and then ever so often you kind of check in and, hey, what's going on with this, or what's going on with that, and, and how are these things you know, sort of unfolding? Are we still going in the same direction that we wanted to go in? And uh, I know for us, we were, we were fortunate that uh, you know, the, the last few years have been really great, and as we've continued to grow, we said, hey, we need to put some things in place so that the staff feel like they have an advocate. Uh, one of the things that, that I was finding, and um, I'm very open for this, but I didn't want staff to feel like if they came to me with something that was important to them, that they were going to be judged later when it came time for a promotion or an opportunity or something along those lines. And so it was really important to get uh, uh, an HR consultant in to our office who uh, had a hotline that 
staff could call and they could talk about things. And then, you know, for us, us dumb old guys who, you know, don't really have all of it figured out, then they're able to sort of filter it to us and say, okay, here's some things I think you need to know. Here's some things I think you need to be aware of. Here's some things I think you want to consider. How do we solve them? And then that way it can all be done anonymously. And so then when John Doe or Jane Doe come up later uh, and, you know, are looking for an opportunity on a project, they don't feel like, well, I want to go ask about leading this project. But I told them about, you know, how I was crying over my dog that, you know, <laughs> ran away. And I don't want them to think that I'm, you know, and so right. we want staff to feel like, they have an advocate. They have someone they can turn to, and that's separate and apart from their work product. It's separate, and it, it's, I mean, we all have lives. We all have things that go on in our lives. They're two different things. It doesn't have to, they don't have to be, you know, tied together. All right, so I'm going to take this quick moment to um, those of you who have questions. Um, now would be the opportunity to kind of raise your hand to the ushers and Hand those questions on down. They'll be collected here at the end, and we will go through them in a few minutes. All right, so um, as an architect, we've all been trained in uh, the traditional, familiar, Western, classical understanding of architecture. And I would love to hear from each of you how you believe that Jedi principles um, can affect and can be borne out in the actual practice of architecture and where you might have seen those profound effects. You know, how does equity and diversity allow us to, um, to, to crystallize, the, crystallize that value of diversity in the projects that we're working on? Because we all have work to do, and we want to prove that the work that we are doing is really actually making a difference and is influenced by um, and will be affected by uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. All right. Pascal, I think. Sure. Um, I have a story. So uh, <laughs> I have lots of stories. Um, I was on a panel with somebody, Phoebe, and she was a, a professor. And she talked about one of her semester projects was actually to have the students design a, a residential kind of complex for a Native American community. And so the students worked on their project. And for midterm, they actually went to the reservation to present. And when they asked for feedback, they were like, do you want real feedback? Or they're like, yeah, yeah tell us what you think. You know, we're so excited. And they said, you know, everything you've proposed are rectangular or orthogonal buildings. And we see those as really oppressive structures. And so it really, nothing that you've presented today aligns with what our culture is, what our architecture styles are, and what we feel or what we need for the built environment. And I tell that story often because it talks about our intentions, that we think we're designing projects for a group of our community, and so it's the best thing ever. Meanwhile, we never talked to them. We did a great, great Google search for 15 minutes and thought we like understood the complexities of both where they are and their aspirations for the built environment. So I think, and so from that experience, those kids were crying. They're really upset because they had spent half a semester working on a project that really failed on the important levels that it needed to pass. Um, and so they were able to engage that community and by final was able to get to a project that everybody found um, power and importance within. The second story I'll tell you is my project, Bronx Point, which is in the Bronx in New York. It's a 542 affordable housing building with a 10 theater cinema, the first brick and mortar hip hop museum, community facility and retail component against the waterfront and a public park. And so with our community engagement, we would go to community board meetings, but also hang out in the community on the weekends. We did these, these tents on the Saturdays in the park to just talk to families and always had surveys about what they wanted to see for this site that had been open and vacant for so long. And 80% of the surveys came back about having more barbecue grills. <laughs> and so we're going through these surveys and the client's like, all right, well, we, that's not in our scope, so chuck it. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. It's not that black people just love barbecue. We love it, <laughs> but it's what the barbecues represent, right? We are usually living in New York in these tiny spaces. And our culture actually lends itself to having community gatherings with family. And so these barbecue grills represent an opportunity for them to have gatherings with their families to share a meal. So although barbecue grills is not necessarily in our Bronx Point project, 
It's something the community who you ask for feedback is telling you very loudly is important to them. So if not us, we need to take this request to somebody. And the client's like, no, forget it. We'll pay for it. So let's triple the barbecues. And I was like, yes, I got more barbecue grills. And I know it sounds silly and stupid and you know, small, but I think it, it will resonate as important to a lot of people who took the time to engage with us, to fill out those surveys. And if we did that project, without making that change to the barbecue grill, then that's another moment where we would have lost respect and a credibility with the community when they tell you what they feel and we don't show up to that capacity. So the other thing I want to say is like, you know, understanding that there's ways of engagement, but all of it always stems from actually engaging the community that you're impacting, that we can't do it from our desks. We are not God's gift to the built environment. Um, we are just the tool that is really an asset for the community to use to make their communities better. And PJ, you're in healthcare. That seems a much more tighter kind of envelope around which to work, but what is your experience? Yeah, I, I have a story about education, actually, okay. since we, we do have a significant education uh, practice as well. But I heard this story from our director of communications lately. So we opened up a student center recently. It's a new project, and it opened up in York University in Toronto. Uh, and that university is a very, very diverse university, about 55,000 students. And it does have a large Muslim population, about 1,500 or so. And so when we opened up the project, you know, we did the usual uh, promotion of, hey, look at our beautiful building. It's glass and this beautiful ceiling and the lights and, you know, the usual stuff that you talk about projects. And, there wasn't a whole lot of attention. We just did not get people interested. Uh, internally, we knew why it was so important, but just did not get a whole lot of hits. Just nothing happened. And so this, the communications team went back to the designers, and they said, here's what we're promoting. Is what, what's wrong with this picture? And the team said, well, you've missed the point. That The whole idea of design uh, on that campus was about getting the opinions from the students about what they wanted. They actually had 12,000 students participate in surveys and give their opinions of what was important to them. And so what came out of those surveys, uh, they were things like an entire floor in the student center that was dedicated for universal prayer. Anybody could go there and have a prayer, whatever religion it happened to be, because they had heard stories from the students saying, we, we have to find a corner in a corridor somewhere or a little isolated uh, you know, uh, office or a classroom so we can go have a prayer. <laughs> And so an entire floor dedicated for something like that. Another one was adding a food pantry. You know, there are several donations that come to the university that can go to the food pantry because what a lot of folks don't recognize is you, you work really hard to get to the university, but then what? The, 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 food, the, the unavailability of the students to be able to access food at all times is actually a really big issue. And so having this food pantry where the folks could go, the students could go and get food for free, that was a big deal. And that sort of an inclusion made a really big difference in how this project was constructed and designed. Uh, and so the team went back and decided to change how they were promoting what this building was. Because what's really important to the community, what do people want to hear? You know, it's not about, and I hate the word archibabble, it's not that. You know, yes, they are beautiful projects and they are wonderful. I mean, that, that is important in my mind. It, um, by no means am I saying that that's not important. But the real story of why that project was designed and why is it so important for the students, that's the story that needs to be told. Uh, yeah, and in my mind, that's, I think that, that's, that's pretty darn fantastic that mm -hmm. you can design something like that for students. Great. Well, so um, this is our last question, and we want to, you guys have done a great job of telling us how to. Um, what are the strategies in, in the workplace? What are the barriers and what are some of the issues? Um, at this point, I'd love to hear from you in your careers, and some of us have been in our careers a little bit longer than others. I would love for you to speak to your experience navigating the power structures, both in the early phases of your careers, but also how you have changed or grown as a result of those, con of, of that, as grown as a consequence of those experiences now that you are at the top of the pyramid. And I, did you get that question? Kind of got a little jumbled <laughs> up in there. But we want to hear how you navigated the power structure 
to end up where you are as successful professionals at the top of your profession. And PJ, if you don't mind, I, I'd sure. like to go right back to you. Um, and I talked about this a little bit again, mom of twins. Uh, it, was, it was hard coming back into the workforce, right? Um, and that, that was early on in my career. I was very fortunate earlier in my career to have a role model within, within the firm that I, I chose to work with at FKP Architects at the time, which is now Canon Design. Um, and I recognized the importance of having that role model, but the things that I recognized of how important it was to bring along not just the female leadership, but the male leadership along with us. And I've, I've told this story before, but it, it's, it's so uh, meaningful to me um, about the time that I came back from my pregnancy. And it is so normal for people to have conversations about moms who come back, you know, after childbirth. Oh, she, she just had a baby. She probably will not want to travel. You know, let's not put her on the heavy-duty projects because she doesn't want to do these things. She just had a baby. You know, the, the thing about that is I hate people having conversations about my career without me being in the room. Ask me <laughs> what I want to do, right? I mean, that is so important that you cannot assume these things, whether it's, it's a young mom, it's a young dad, whatever that conversation is, you have to include that person. And so when I came back, I mean, that was a big deal. I really didn't want to travel. But I had a client uh, in the Northeast that I had finished a project with, wanted to do the second phase, and really asked for me to come back. And um, at the point, I didn't know this, but the project manager, uh, one of my mentors, actually went to the client and said, well, if you want PJ on the project, you will organize yourself. You will make sure that your meetings are done in three days. She will come in on a Monday morning. She will leave Wednesday night. You will make sure you're organized. If your meetings are not scheduled, you will go to the next day. Uh, is that okay with you? And they said, yeah, sure, that's fine. And he didn't tell me this story you know, up until the time I said, yes, I will go do the project. But that's how I was able to do the project is because I had someone who was advocating for me and opening the door to allow me to continue to do this. And it, it makes me tear up. Is it, it wasn't the person that I thought who would do this for me, but really someone who was listening along the way and paying attention to my career and doing this for me. You know? and, and for me, you, know, you talk about power struggles, uh, sort of a story of almost the opposite of somebody helping me along the way to get this done. But you know, whether you find those people in your firms or not, you need to be those people who open the doors, who make those conversations happen who don't take away opportunities from people just because of whatever that reason might be. I mean, that don't, don't wait for anybody, because unless somebody makes a change, it, it's going back to your point, none of those conversations ever happen. Have the right conversations. James, not because you're long in the tooth, but um, <laughs> <laughs> can you talk a little bit about your experience um, moving through the structure of being a leader in architecture? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, you were talking about mentors and I, I, I totally subscribe to mentors and it's kind of interesting. You mentioned, uh, you know, getting teary when you think about, uh, what this, you know, mentor did for you. And I, I had a mentor, uh, uh still call him a mentor, still call him a friend. He's not with us anymore, but Phil Freelon, uh, was very instrumental in, uh, my career, as well as uh, many other architects, but um, Phil, when when I first started uh, Harrison Kornberg, we, I mean, you don't know what you don't know, and um, Phil and I had a friendship, and I'd call him, and you know, we'd sort of, as as the old folks say, we kind of hoorah each other, and we joke with each other, and go back and forth. And I asked him, I said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get this thing off the ground. And, you know, when I was growing up, John Chase was sort of my mentor and idol. And I could look at him and kind of, you know, guide my practice based off of the things he did. But um, you and I are contemporaries and, you know, I love what you're doing. And, and I knew his firm when it was below 20. And so I said, you know, kind of what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? How can I make this better? And so uh, he said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you just come up here to North Carolina and spend a day with us and I'll take you through the firm and show you how it all works. And so uh, Daniel and I flew up to North Carolina and uh, we started like at eight o'clock in the morning and Phil took us through accounting and he took us to all his project managers. And he took us into marketing. And then at the end of the day, 
um, he took us out to dinner. And, you know, he just showed us, he just opened his playbook and said, yeah, here's, here's how you do it. And so um, at the end of the day, I remember just telling him, you know, Phil, I really appreciate this. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know what to say. I mean, this is, this is incredible. Uh, and I really appreciate you doing this for me. Um, and his response to me was, I would do it a lot more, but nobody asked me. And so, um, you know, I, mentors are very important, but I think that in addition uh, to, to sort of having them be there, you've got to seek them out. And then, um, you know, understand that they're all busy, but, you know, if they say they care and if they make a commitment, you know, trust that they're going to be there for you. And, uh, and he was there for me whenever I had hard times in the profession, whenever there were things that I just wanted to cry about or, you know, I was dealing with, you know, how do I go after this project or how do I go after that project? And, and, uh, there were just, yeah, there were just a lot of different times when, when I could look to him for guidance. And, um, and I miss that. I miss my friend being there. Um, and so now, um, whenever I talk to young architects, I encourage uh, having a mentor more than just one uh, because people get busy. Uh, whenever I meet uh, a woman architect, I'm always like, you got to meet Nicola and you got to meet Anzi. Uh, these women are incredible. Um, because sometimes I think it's important for us to have mentors that look like us. Um, and, you know, if nothing more than just to be able to look at them and say, you know, they did it, I can do it. Uh, I had John Chase. And so my journey in architecture was different than his journey in architecture. He didn't have anyone that he could look at and say, I could do it because they did it. He had to do it on his own. So. I mean, I think that I'll just slip in a comment here about that, me being long in the tooth and having gone through this a long time. But um, I, I think when we talk about unconscious bias or you even talk about um, mentors and people that you, you, you don't even know that there are people mm -hmm. out there supporting you and looking after you and encouraging you behind the scenes, right? And I think it's important sometimes to realize that that is one thing that's going on. But also, um, I, I'm one of those persons that I didn't see somebody that looked like me, and I didn't have a problem with that. And, but I think, was it last year or two years ago, I met Donna Carter, who was the first um, female African-American architect in um, Texas. And um, I think she's probably about 70 years old. And when I met her, I was in such awe. I didn't even realize that this was something that I was missing, you know? And it was just like, oh my gosh, um, you, you know what I'm talking about. You understand architecture the way I understand it, or, you know, and just how important it is to engage those people and talk to them because it will do you some good and it really will help you grow in your profession. So, I just wanted to share that. Um, so now we're going to get to the business of answering some of your questions. And all right, you guys ready for this? So, yes. Um, how do you address unpaid maternity leave in, in your firm? This should not be addressed by AIA if we sh this should not be addressed by AIA if we want to include more women in architecture. So, how do you address unpaid maternity leave in your firm? Do, or, you know, I can I can take a stab at that. We, um, you know, most people in in the office know if you come to me with uh, HR issues and whatnot, I'll say, well, yeah, you got to talk to Melissa or Erica. I, I have no idea what's going on. Um, but one of the things that we we did do because as we continued to grow and as we started looking at the people that we were attracting and the talent that we had. We knew that, um, you know, there were going to be males and, well, females and males that were going to want to start families. And so even though we are not required to, because our firm's only 40 people, we're not 50 people, we have uh, instituted a FMLA light in our uh, organization so that uh, people don't have to feel that if they get 
pregnant and they go off, they're going to lose their jobs. Um, now that puts the pressure on me to keep the work in, <laughs> but, um, you know, they're, they're, those are some of the things that we do to try to, um, uh, encourage that and support that. And then the other thing, uh, and we had a situation in our office, uh, this was a number of years ago where, uh, we, and this was just our own ignorance, uh, because we didn't know, you don't know what you don't know. But we had a um, individual who had cancer. And because we were a small firm, we were like, well, let's try to do something to help this individual. Let's try to, you know, we want to, you know, try to help them. We don't want to just cut them off. And, you know, HR came to us and said, well, if you do that for this catastrophic situation and you don't do anything for pregnancy, which is a catastrophic situation, you're discriminating. And so we just rewrote our whole policy. So, I mean, I, I, it may be easier because we're a smaller firm and I'm an owner. And so if we want to change the rules, we can change the rules. But I think that when you see things that are just a part of you know, human nature, human condition, you, you, it's incumbent to respond. Uh, I guess if you have any heart. Well, that, that's, I think you, hit yeah. <laughs> you have to have a hard time. <laughs> I, th I mean, ooh, wow. Unpaid maternity leave. So for those who don't know, it's not a vacation. Um, we're not living the dream, taking all naps throughout the day. Um, and it's a, it's a very trying, difficult, lovely, but difficult time in your life, and um, finding and having support is, is critical. Um, I was telling Sharon earlier that in my previous firm, the 13 women who had went on maternity leave in the time that I was there all left right after they had their kid. And in my head, I was like, oh, they just like must like love their kids so much more than <laughs> boring buildings that that's why they didn't come back. And it wasn't till um, I was pregnant and talking to my boss at the time saying, you know, I realize nobody like comes back. Um, and he said, yeah, you know, when you're not here, it's like really difficult to keep you in mind. So you should probably call us while you're on maternity leave to, um, you know, make sure that you have something to come back to. Um, and so there's this understanding and what I'm trying to share in this story, which is totally not eloquently spoken at all, but is that I should have started to see those moments or see those clues that my firm was going to have an interesting policy when it comes to maternity <laughs> leave or just the way the mentality was about that session or that phase in, our, in, our, in my life, that um, when you're looking at firms and when you're looking for um, where you want to build your career, you need to start having those conversations about what is your maternity policy. And if they really hold to this thing like, nah, we ain't going to pay you after you've been here forever and you're like half dying, um, then that might be an indication that that's not a good place for you to put your roots in and grow. And I'm not saying that everybody has all this opportunity to kind of dip out whenever they want, but you definitely need to start having these conversations and take note about how you're treating um, the different staff and, and knowing what those challenges are. Um, and, and so I guess I'm saying to us, be aware, right? right? And, and ask questions right. and have a lawyer in your back pocket. But right. that's all I'm going to say. No, I mean, that, that segues really well into our next question is that as a minority architect, have you learned to self-advocate? And what about making sure that you're looking after yourself and self-care? Okay. Well, I used <laughs> NOMA. Um, NOMA 2014 was the, well, sorry, I hit this kind of cap at my previous firm and I couldn't quite break through. And even though I had mentors, multiple mentors, some in the firm, some outside of the firm, I realized I needed to do something different. So when I saw that NOMA was having a conference, I actually submitted to do a, a seminar, which was my first ever, and then I prepared for it for, for months. And in doing that, I had to present to the partners and principals so that they can appro approve my content because I was talking about our project, our workflow, our staff, and so on and so forth. And once they saw me present, and then I got really great feedback from those who attended the conference, they're like, oh, Pascal's a public speaker. Um, let's include her in more of our BD meetings. Let's take her on some of these interviews. And so it actually, I leveraged one community that gave me a chance 
to actually open the door for me in my career, in my office life, to show and flex a skill set that nobody had kind of even knew I had because nobody cultivated, so they assumed it wasn't there. So I guess my point is sometimes you need to create the opportunities for you, and looking at organizations that champion people like us is part of that kind of tool in your back pocket that you can leverage for those moments. And the one thing I add is to, to that is, you know, we're very timid to ask other people to speak for us. Um, yes, it's, 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 you, you can speak for yourself, but everybody, you know, has different limits of how much they can talk about themselves and advocate themselves. Uh, but worse than that is it's so hard, especially as women, to go to other women and say, will you promote me? Will you do this for me? And ask those questions. And we don't do that often enough. So I think in my mind, yes, you have to advocate, and I have to advocate myself. But what I have to teach myself more is to approach other women and other men to promote me. And I, by promote, I don't mean promotion. Okay. I mean mm-hmm. to just just to sponsor, sponsor me, you. to talk about me, to have those conversations behind closed doors about right. you know what about PJ? Yeah. Is make sure that my name was spoken by other people, and you just have to do that. You just have to do it. I think it's true. I think yeah. And part is finding sponsors Mm -hmm. to advocate for you. But like Pascal mentioned, there's so many different forms of visibility. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just have to be in your firm. Mm -hmm. You don't have to build, well, it's great if you are able to build your career and all your skill set within a firm. But that's putting a lot of weight Mm -hmm. on on an opportunity that just may not be there for you. Mm -hmm. And it may be a lot of the times it's just time. It's just bad timing. But there are other organizations like NOMA, AIA, there's STEM presentations, there's local community involvement, there's citizen architecture. You can be a citizen architect. You can be part of your community. You can uh, go for public uh, volunteerism. There's so many different things that build those skill sets that then you can loop back. And sometimes, like for me, I just started doing these things outside of the firm because I was passionate about them. And I was trying to solve a problem in my community that I, that I felt I could address. And it just looped back into my firm, but it wasn't intentional. I didn't go and say, oh, I'm going to build this committee because it's going to make me director of EDI. I didn't even think that that was a thing that could happen. Right. So finding those opportunities and, and seeing yourself as a visible person, it's sort of like building your brand too. Mm-hmm. But think, think big and think beyond your firm and your immediate uh, circumstance because there's so many opportunities available that will overlap eventually, and that's where the richness will come. And actually, to kind of go back to another question about power structures, is the same thing. We often think about power structures from a position of a firm, but in actuality, there's different power structures in the built environment. So we don't always have to kind of work within the firms to break down and create policies that make things more equitable, but also just understanding what we can do to a larger community. So, for example. Um, we can serve on community board meetings or com- community boards. So when they're thinking about where they're going to put their next sanitation facility plant treatment, um, we are in the space to say, no, not this community. They already have five. Okay, can we somebody else do it now? <laughs> but that's another way of showing um, how we can create justice in the built environment, but understanding that power isn't always residing in the firm, that power also is with a greater community as well. So with that power, architects are often the prime consultants in charge of a design team. Um, Do you or does your firm consider diversity of your consultants and engineers when hiring them? Yes, Yes. and I've also noticed that that is asked more consistently now in RFPs and RFQs. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were even asked recently, do you have mentorship programs when you partner? How do you build uh, minority and and women business enterprises up? So even clients now are asking, what are you doing to affect your industry? Mm -hmm. Because we want to see a a better, a a level playing field. Mm -hmm. So we, it's, if we aren't aware of it, our clients are going to make us aware of it, so we should be proactive and create these partnerships and these opportunities to mentor. Yeah, and I think it becomes very obvious when you do it for the reason of answering an RFQ right. versus yeah. right. truly having that as an integrated practice of how you select your partners. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, they're truly your partners, and uh, you know, the written language just sort of gets market speak yeah. um, mm-hmm. and I, I think clients who are really looking for that can see through it right. so I think the practices yes they are in the RFQs but they're in the RFQs for a reason for it to become part of your culture 
And so the clients that's how are you asking select. for it because they're aware of the community, what's coming up. Yeah, yeah. They know that they have diverse um, folks that are in their schools, in their universities, mm-hmm. in their mm-hmm. hospitals, and they want to be sure that they're mm-hmm. going to get the holistic sort of response yeah. that they need to make sure, like we said, that they're getting the right kind of architect. 